Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in tonight. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Les Standiford to discuss Miami Noir, the classics, published by our friends at Akashic Books. Les Standiford is the author of 24 books and novels, including the award-winning John Deal thriller series and the works of narrative nonfiction, Last Train to Paradise, the one read choice of a dozen public library systems, and Bringing Adam Home, a Wall Street Journal number one true crime bestseller. He is director of the MFA program in creative writing at Florida International University. The best-selling original, Miami Noir, edited by Les and published in 2006, featured brand new stories from some of the city's best living writers. Now, in Miami Noir, the classics, Les has turned his eye toward the outstanding noir fiction of yesteryear. For tonight's virtual celebration, we're joined by Trish McGregor, Lynn Barrett, Vicki Hendricks, Preston Allen, and John Dufresne, who will read from their respective stories. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by clicking the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to those right after the talk. We've disabled the chat just to create a little more room on the screen, but we'll enable it at the end so we can hear everything you're saying. Uh, remember, you can order copies of Miami Noir, the classics, by pressing the green button at the bottom of the screen. You can also use the donate button to support Books and Books, and any amount is welcome. Remember that indie bookstores need your help now more than ever, so we thank you. And now, without further ado, I'd like to bring Les to the stage. Hi, Les. Wow. Hello, Christina. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Uh, I'm t you do that so very well. I think you have a career in television or in whatever you call this, uh, Matrix Vision. LOL. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's great to be here, and I'm, I'm glad we can all gather, at least in this form, at, at the very least. I look forward to the time when we can all be back together, F2F, as they say, in screen talk. But uh, on the other hand, uh, geez, I, I, sometimes it makes it possible for readers who couldn't otherwise get to a program like this to make it. And also, uh, same, by the same token, for uh, audience members who uh, who might not be able to get down to the bookstore itself to be here. So I guess that's the positive side of this. At any rate, it's good to be here. I'm glad to have the opportunity and 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 also to have so many of my good friends and uh, great writers uh, with me that you're going to hear from shortly. This, the original Miami Noir, uh, came out in 2006, and that was a compendium of stories that were composed originally for that volume. I went out and uh, approached a wide cross-section of, of fine writers who were interested in Miami and asked if they might have something, an idea that uh, they could bring to, to fruition for the volume of short stories based upon concept of Miami Noir. And uh, that book did, I think, very well for Akashic Books. Johnny Temple had this concept where he would go around to various leading cities in the United States, try to get anthologies of crime fiction put together for each of them. Shortly, uh, it did well, uh, I think, for Johnny, and that made him decide, oh, well, let's have another in the series and that in his thinking should be Miami Noir the classics and what he meant by that was not stories that were composed for inclusion in this volume but stories that had been published prior to the appearance of the first Noir volume and there were 
there was Brooklyn Noir, the classics, and New York, Manhattan, the classics, and San Francisco, the classics, and Boston, the classics. And I said, yeah, Johnny, that's great. But, you know, Miami's been in existence about a third as long as all those cities. And uh, the there really wasn't a literary community here in in Miami for much of that time because everybody was scrabbling hard just trying to survive during much of that time. And Johnny's response was, oh, Shaw, you can do it. Just uh, go looking for those stories and get back to me once you're finished. Well, it took a while, but uh, finally I set myself to the task and lo and behold, was I surprised to be able to go back as far as 1925 and find a story by none other than Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, the lyric defender of the Everglades, mind you, in the minds of most, and find that she had published a story in the, uh, an issue of the Saturday Evening Post that was about crime and punishment. Uh, she was a reporter at the Miami Herald at the time, and uh, someone else living in Miami said, Marjorie, you know, you could make a few extra bucks by writing fiction for the Saturday Evening Post. And really, she said, and uh, sat down and composed uh, a story, sold, I think it was her second published story, actually, uh, in the Post that fit the parameters for this uh, anthology perfectly. And it went on through a story published in the 30s by Lester Dent, who became the progenitor of the Doc Savage series, and Damon Runyon, and uh, on and on and on, up through Charles Williford, uh, who really sort of presaged the explosion of the so-called Miami School of Crime Fiction that began in the late 18th, 1980s and into the end of the 90s and spawned the careers of Carl Hyacin, Dave Barry, uh, James W. Hall, and so many more. I was familiar with the, 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 the prolific output of the Miami school of the 80s and 90s, but nobody was writing short fiction at the time because the markets for short fiction, for crime short fiction, uh, had dried up by then. There had been before and previously a number of pulp uh, monthly uh, publications that featured crime fiction, Black Mask and, and so forth, but uh, those were all uh, had gone by the by by the 80s. And so there wasn't anything in it to write short fiction, short mystery and crime fiction in for the most part uh, by that time. And so uh, Hyacinth and everybody else was writing novels, wrote a lot, Elmore Leonard, they wrote a lot of novels, but not a lot of short fiction. And, uh, and yet, and yet, uh, there were all these gems to be sort of mined from, from history. I think I was uh, surpri as surprised as Johnny was confident that this would lead to something. In some, when you take a look at the stories that are co co uh, collected in this volume, what you get in my mind is a brand new way of looking at Miami history. Johnny uh, Temple asked me, how are we going to arrange these lists? And I said, very simple. We're going to arrange them chronologically because laid end to end from 1925 right up into the present day, you get a picture of Miami history like none other. And I, uh, I, I was gratified to see that uh, many of the reviews that have come out uh, echo that sentiment, that it really is a surprise to people to see how Miami has grown from you know, a farming community populated by almost no one to what it is today, as viewed through the lens of these fine writers who have chosen the crime and mystery and more uh, tradition to propel their visions. 
I'm uh, so happy that uh, so many of my friends have agreed uh, to join me this evening to share a bit of their work and then following uh, what they the, that snippet that they read will convene again to talk a little bit amongst ourselves. And then, as Christina suggested, she'll field the questions uh, that are come in uh, on the uh, uh, on the screen, and we'll divvy them up as best we can. That part, all this part, is a little bit awkward, and we apologize for it in advance. But like we say, it's a heck of a lot better than nothing. So I'm going to uh, introduce our uh, evening's readers in the order that their stories uh, are published in the book for the most part, although John Dufresne is going to jump out of order and I'm going to let him uh, finish up because he's got a, a, a piece that's complete but short enough to read in its entirety and I thought it would be a good way to close. Opening up for us is Trish McGregor. Trish, or TJ, is an Edgar winner, the author of 42 novels, as well as a dozen books on astrology, tarot, and dreams. Most recent novel is Skin Shifters. And Trish, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Les, and thank you, Christina. You're great at this. Um, the short story I've got here, it's called The Works. It takes place on South Beach. I know how it is down here on the beach for the old ones now, what with rising prices and traffic and crime. They're afraid to go out at night. Their social security checks barely cover a month of meals at Wolfie's. They feel like Miami Beach's postscript. The Art Deco craze did it, you know. Ever since folks decided Deco was in again, those little hotels over on Ocean Drive are becoming are booming with business, Change, charging prices like I can't believe, and yeah, people pay them. I mean, 70 bucks for a room no longer, no larger than a closet, five bucks for a hard-boiled egg and a slice of bread that's hardly toasted, two bucks for coffee. The old ones can remember when coffee in these places cost a dime. There's a haughty look to the hotels that really gets me, too. They stand so prim and proper at the edge of the sea, all puffed up in pastels, windows so clean they gleam like jewels. The old ones feel like they can't afford to even walk there. And when they do, shuffling on their tired bones under the weight of 80 or 90 years of memories, they're nearly trampled by the youthful crowds rushing to this hotel or that bar. So I keep my prices low and do what I can. When an old one is troubled or sad, sick or too drunk to stand, I take him or her in. Word has gotten around that Millie's place is where you go when it's gotten bad. Like tonight, for instance. Toby wandered in off Washington Avenue a few minutes ago, <clears throat> out of the dark night heat, looking about as bad as a man can look and still be alive. He's 94 years old with a spine so bent he can hardly lift his head, glasses thicker than his arm, a heart that just won't quit. He's counting $1 bills from a tattered envelope with Social Security Administration in bold black letters across the top. If I remember correctly, he worked nearly half a century for an auto parts plant that merged with another plant, and most of his pension got lost in the transition. His Social Security check amounts to about $300 a month, and we all know what that buys you in Miami Beach. The room's only six bucks, Toby, I tell him, and he keeps counting out the bills. Want a meal, too, he mumbles, moving his dentures around in his mouth because they hurt his gums. Eight bucks, then. And the works. I think I want the works, Millie. You better be sure. It's a bit more expensive. His head bobs slowly. It reminds me of a beach ball, rising, falling, riding a wave, and I want to stroke it, embrace it, kiss this odd, beautiful head. It's as hairless as a chihuahua with a mass of wrinkles that seem to quiver and dance to the back of his skull. Not so long ago, on a rainy afternoon down at the Ace Club, some of the old ones and I gathered around Toby's head to see if we could read our fortunes in the wrinkles like they were creases in a palm. I'm sure, he says softly, depositing an old canvas bag on the counter, straining to look up. How much? His eyes behind these thick glasses are alarmingly small, almost transparent. I feel like they might disappear at any second. <clears throat> 25. I guess you know what all that fee includes. That's it. At least, <laughs> not the whole story, but... <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, <clears throat> we get a sense of what's coming, Trish. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Uh, next up, my colleague, my longtime and my invaluable colleague, Lynn Barrett. She's the consigliere of our group. She's the uh, author of the classic, well, I mean by that, if we need to, if somebody needs to remember what the regulation states, we go to Lynn and ask. She's the author of the classic, uh, uh, she's, she's, she's the author of a number of uh, works, including the most recent, Making Good Time, True Stories, of how we do and don't get around in South Florida. She's also previously the winner of an Edgar for the best short story of the year and the gold medal from the Florida Book Awards. And you're going to see why she's garnered all those accolades. Lynn? Thank you so much. I've had the, I've been giving myself the pleasure of reading the book chronologically a bit at a time. And so I just read Trisha's very recently, uh, and it's a really great story. Just want to say, you want to go on. Uh, mine is uh, <clears throat> is called To Go, um, and uh, it was published in the 90s originally. And so here it comes. So I insist that we stop, and at least I'll get something to go. Even if BK won't come in, won't eat, his stomach nervous, he's in such a rush to make Clewiston by noon. He stays in the cool car while I pass through bright heat into one of those places, lunch counter, souvenir store, where the air has the sweet mustiness of pecans and orange wine. I wait while they zap the saucer's biscuits and when I come out with iced teas on a tray and hop into the Chrysler, he's dead. Hunched over the wheel with the same glare he had when he drove a two lane and some old timer in an airstream got ahead of him and nothing. Not flashing the high beams, not honking, not gunning up to ride three inches from the guy's bumper, nothing would make the slow poke speed up. BK looks just like that now, aggravated and dead, clutching the wheel. His cheeks are slippery with tears and there's a faint bad smell. The air conditioner is blasting, the motor runs ragged. I stick my foot over and press his shoe down on the gas and the idle richens. I want to charge inside and howl for help. But I know, for once in my life, I ought to stop and think. I look through purple-tinted windows at the parking lot. Nobody in sight but some family at a picnic table under the sign for live baby alligators and goat's milk fudge. If I go inside, I'll have to say, excuse me, Mr. Brian Kittery is out there dead. It must have been his heart. His stomach bothered him last night, but it always did. He used to say, nobody dies of indigestion, and it never slowed him down. Sure, we did it that morning in that motel on South Dixie. He liked to stay in whenever he visited the home office. Me leaning on the table, looking out the window at the sunlit swimming pool, him with his pants around his ankles, as if when he finished, he would yank them up and dash. But that was his favorite way, and it was his idea. Don't blame me. He wouldn't. He wasn't that kind of guy. Impatient, sure, with inept cashiers, Zavala Jr. at the home office, but basically fair. He groused about phoning his wife in Arcadia every evening at 7, but he did it on the dot, I noticed. When I first rode with him six weeks ago, he was so jumpy. I thought he could be one of those guys like they show on TV. Mr. Normal, church choir, wife and two kids in Little League who is socking it away the whole time, stealing everyone's investments and then takes off. But no, I got to see he was just in a rush, horny, in hock, buying scratch off lottery tickets, pressing to make time on the road, driving up and down Florida, stopping in every I Love Jesus beauty parlor and auto repair to sell his line of beauty products, Seagrave Scrub, an alligator mask and key lime conditioner with me as his demo. It was his great idea, my fake ID saying I'm 42 years old and look 30, when really I'm 26 looking 30, which is an achievement if you ask me, because I've been through enough to look 42. I'll stop there. <laughs> uh, thank you, Lynn. Thank you so much. Well, Next up in position of publication is Les Stanford. What to say about Les Stanford? Not since Tolstoy? Well, maybe not. Maybe I'll just read you uh, a few words from Tahiti Junk Shop. 
It's bad news, isn't it? Garen didn't have to look up to see who was speaking. It was a favorite trick of Adele's, shadowing him down to the mailboxes. He stood in a peeling little alcove off the shabby main lobby of their Hollandale building, a testament to the better intentions of a, another South Florida era. He studied the wall cracks that radiated out from the bank of brass boxes in the pattern of a giant spider web. In a moment, she'd deliver one of the incessant invitations to her apartment for coffee, for cake, for a little chat, as if they just happened to bump in to each other. He folded the letter and put it in the breast pocket of his coat, a smoking jacket he'd salvaged from the effects of his father decades ago. Adele watched him, practically gloating. Maybe she'd been reading over his shoulder. Investments, he said, affecting a philosophical tone. One accepts the bad with the good. In truth, his heart had turned to lead. Sinking good money into a snow pea farm in the desert is not an investment, she said. So she had been looking. He glanced about the tiny mail room. Adele, no giant, nonetheless blocked his way to the door. You look a little gray, she said in a softened tone. How about some chicken soup? I have business, he said. There's always time to file bankruptcy, she sniffed. Besides, I wanted to tell you. The Centurion Village representative, representative is coming to talk to us today. She produced a colorful brochure from behind her back. He'd seen it before, littering the tables of the common rooms. It was full of pictures of oldsters, biking, swimming, dancing, and shuffleboarding, cavorting in the Florida sun and enjoying the golden years. Just looking at all that activity made him feel tired. He took the brochure and pointed at the immense condominium building that was featured in almost every shot. They ought to put some bars over all those windows, he told her, because none of those people will ever get out. She snatched the brochure back. That's ridiculous, she said. This is a place where you could put what you've got left. It'll do you some good. Garen saw that her eyes were starting to water. He knew what she wanted. They should pledge all their assets, turn over everything to this coven of the dead and dying and move in together. Wait hand in hand in a wallboard cave for the inevitable. He had to admit they were clever, these centurions. Just give up everything you have and they guarantee you peace of mind for as long as you live and pray that it's not too long. That centurion thing's a scam. It was a new voice echoing about the gloomy meal room. Garen and Adele spun about, a shambling man who might have been in his 50s wearing a checked sport coat and white shoes and belt had appeared in the doorway. He indicated the brochure in Adele's hand. You give them everything, including your social security and sign a blanket power of attorney. They got you by the cojones for the rest of your life, which probably ain't too long given the quality of the food I hear they put out. There we go. Next up, Vicki Hendricks. Lynn and John Dufresne and I are proud to claim Vicki as our former student and alumna of our creative writing program. She's the author of the classic Miami Purity and the recipient, she is an Edgar Award finalist in the novel. She now lives up in central Florida where her most recent novel, Her People, is set. Come on, Vicki, share us a little bit. Okay, um, I also have to say that the stories in here are so wonderful. I thought I had read all the stories of people I knew, but a lot of them are new to me and I've just really been enjoying them. Okay, so um, read uh, the first page of Gators 
and it has a first person narrator, but I want to tell you it's not me, even though um, it was inspired by one of my old boyfriends, as are many of my stories. <laughs> and this one was particularly inspiring, Gators. It was a goddamn one-armed alligator put me over the line. After that, I was looking for trouble. Carl and me had been married for two years, second marriage for both, and the situation was drastic, hateful most times. But I could tell he didn't realize there was anything better in the world. It made me feel bad that he never learned how to love, grew up with nothing but cruelty. I kept trying way too long to show him there was something else. I was on my last straw when I suggested a road trip for Labor Day weekend, stupidly thinking that I could amuse him and wouldn't have to listen to his bitching about me and the vile universe on all my days off work. I figured out a motel, he'd get that vacation feeling, lighten up, stick me good, and I could get by for a few waking hours that I had to see him the rest of the week. We headed out to the Everglades for our little trip, being recent transplants from Texas, we hadn't seen the natural wonders in Florida. Carl started griping by mid-afternoon about how I told him there were so many alligators and we couldn't find a fucking one. I didn't dare say that there would have been plenty if he hadn't taken two hours to read the paper and sit on the john. We could have made it before the usual thunderstorms and had time to take a tour. As it was, he didn't want to pay the bucks to ride the tram in the rain, even though the cars were covered. We were pretty much stuck with what we could see driving. Billboards for Seminole gambling and airboats and lots of soggy grassland under heavy black and blue layered skies. True, it had a bleak, haunting kind of beauty. I have to stop there. It gets more complicated. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vicki. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, next up, Preston Allen. Preston is another fine writer we faculty in the FIU writing program are proud to claim as one of our alums. He's the recipient of a Florida Individual Artist Grant, and he's teaching at Miami-Dade College. He's the author of the novel Jesus Boy, and most recently, The Inevitable, my favorite title, Every Boy Should Have a Man. Preston, come on and share with us. Good evening. The sister has the moon in her hair and the wind at her feet. The brother has the wind at his heels. He wants to be a football player when he grows. She wants to run fast and catch medals of gold. But she has the moon in her hair. She is fair. All men stare. She has the moon in her hair. As the wind at his heels, he has thunder and lightning in his hands. He hits hard. He steals fast. He runs fast. His sister, she has the moon in her hair. His little sister. They live in the house in Opalaka their mother does not own. The house of the man with the snake in his eyes. In the summer, when there is no school and the mother goes to work, the man with the snake's eyes locks himself in the room with the sister with the moon in her hair because she is fair. And the brother, he hits hard, he steals fast, he runs fast, he run, runs. He hits fences and cars with baseball bats, he hits walls with clenched fists, its classmates, its teachers. He screams at his mother who will not listen. He wants to be a superhero when he grows taller than the man who owns the house. He is tall now for 14. He wants to be Batman. That, sorry, I didn't introduce the title. That is a story called Superheroes. And a fine one indeed, Preston. Thank you. Closing up the program this evening is John Dufresne. John's been my 
valued colleague for only slightly less time than Lynn Barrett has. He's a former Guggenheim fellow, the author of two New York Times notable books of the year, and also two different stories selected in different years for best American mystery stories. His most recent novel is a mystery set in Las Vegas, starring uh, Detective Wiley Coyote Melville and entitled, I don't like where this is going. Of course, everybody who starts reading that book loves where it's going. John, uh, come on and share with us your story, Paris Bunn. Les, I think he's trying to get on, but hasn't been able to. Not yet. Oh, no. All this time? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. I will read John Dufresne's short story if it comes to it. He, you, he hasn't been able to connect up? Nope. Why don't I do that? And then if he can, if he can come on, because you all... Uh, you all uh, deserve to hear John's story. Sound like a plan? Then Perfect. we can talk a little bit. Maybe we can, maybe we can get them on. Perfect. It's called Lemonade and Paris Buns. Set in Aventura. Originally published in 1996. I called the clinic and made an appointment for a cholesterol test. I ticked that off my list. I called Dental Land at the Aventura Mall. They told me Dr. Shamaski no longer was affiliated with their practice. Well, what was I supposed to do then? I've got this temporary crown here. I thought I heard someone outside talking to Spot. We can set you up with Dr. Perez. Fine, I said Wednesday noon. I dumped the whites into the washer, poured in the tide, set the timer. I walked to the window to check on the voice. Four children sat in the ground near Spot, patting him, talking to him. Spot, I could tell, was loving the attention. I went out to the deck and introduced myself. I said, I'm the dogs, and I was going to say master until I heard the word in my head and realized how absurd it was. I'm the dog's dad, I said. I take care of him. What your dog name? The oldest looking child said. Spot. And yours? They were brothers, I learned, named Smith. The oldest, Travian, probably 10, and introduced me to Demetrius, Everett, and Kendrick. Spot rolled on his back with his legs in the air, like quotation marks. Everett stroked Spot's belly. I asked them where they lived. Travian pointed across the backyard. I asked them if they'd like a snack. They would. So we had brunch on the deck. Travian helped me set the table and led in us in grace before we ate. His idea. We had lemonade and Paris buns. That's what I called them for the occasion. They were crescent rolls, actually, from Pastry Lane. Kendrick, the tiny one, sat in my lap and rubbed the hair on my arm back and forth. Travian was like the father. He poured lemonade for his brothers, wiped their faces with napkins. He asked me what I did for a job. I told him, I write stories. He said, that's what I, that's what he did too. I asked him to tell me a story. Travian told me the one he called the wolf, the bear, the lion, and the man. The four characters are friends and they don't have enough money to buy ice cream. The lion wants to eat the bank to get some. The man says they should go to work and earn the money. The bear is sure they can find some dollars in the street. The wolf says we should just ask nice. And the wolf is right. As I scooped up the chocolate ice cream, I asked Travian, did he have any stories with vegetables in them? No, he didn't. I told them all. They should come by more often. Spot and I would enjoy their company. Travian said where they were living, he pointed across the yard again, was a frosted home, and they didn't know how long they'd be there. Foster home, I said. That's it, Travian said. Everett asked me, where are you, Daddy? 
Louisiana, I said, way far away. I found out that their mama lived with a man named Walter. The granny took care of them for a while. Now they're here. What are your foster parents' names? I said. Travian said, we don't know yet. You think they might be worried where you are? Travian shrugged. I said, well, let's go find them, okay? We all washed up the kitchen sink. We put Spot on his leash and paraded down the street. We waved to Mr. Lesperance next door. Everett walked beside Spot. Spot kept licking Everett's face. Demetrius held the leash. Travian held Kendrick's hand. I held Travian. Travian was sure it was a blue house. We made a couple of lefts and right, but nothing looked familiar. Demetrius told me that Spot pees a lot. Here it is, Travian said. I wanted to ring the bell, let the people know we were back, but Travian wouldn't let me. They're napping, he said. Boys hug Spot. They stood in the driveway and waved goodbye until we turned the corner. This all happened a year and a half ago. I've never seen them again. For a while, Spot and I took our walks by the Blue House. One evening, a man in a t-shirt and shorts stood there in the front yard watering a manila palm. He must have thought I was crazy. No kids ever lived here, he said. I looked around. This was the house. Spot slurped water from the house. The man said, shoo. Spot woofed at him. So you're not a foster parent, I said. He made a face. Spot sniffed around the sidewalk. Evidently, the children's volatile molecules lingered here, though the children did not. I called the welfare. No one there would tell me anything. Confidentiality, the woman said. I said, what kind of a world is this? Four babies wandering the streets. You shouldn't worry, she said. My cholesterol is in the stratosphere, it turns out. So I drink red wine now with my Paris buns. I brunch on the deck with Spot. Imagine Travians telling me, telling me a story with a happy ending. Like maybe he says, the lion wants his friends back, but the man says, forget about it. The bear is sure it was all a dream anyway. But the wolf says, what he believes is, you meet everyone twice before you die. Thank you, John. Bravo. I'm sorry, but John has not been able to get on. So what I'd like to do is remind everyone that they can now ask questions uh, by just clicking on the bottom of the screen where it says, ask a question, and we'd love to hear your questions. And while we get that started, is there anyone you'd like to come on screen, Les, or should we? Well, should we I, I was gonna, you know, we've got this uh, anthology called Miami Noir, and uh, I'm wondering if any of our writers <laughs> thought they were writing noir uh, to be, or what that what noir means to them to begin with, because mm -hmm. I'm sure that question is alive out there as well. Any, uh, any of you all? Yeah, let me get Preston on here and see what he has to say. I think that noir is I, I've thought about this, you know, for a while after since about um, 2000, 2000. <laughs> what is noir? Uh, when it comes to mind, I always think about uh, the movies of the 30s and 40s, uh, darkly lit, um, femme fatale, bogey. Um, Yeah, I think that's where it comes from, you know. Film, uh, more than more than fiction uh, originally. Yeah, yeah, and so, um, but I went across uh, a modern definition or somebody, and it was, I'm going to paraphrase here. 
dark characters who see a problem with the laws as they are written and they do dark things to achieve justice, something like that. Um, so I, I guess for me, that's noir. Um, I like it. When I write noir, that's what I do. So. Yeah. I like it. I like it. Yeah. How about you, yeah. Lynn Barrett? I've just invited her on. She's yeah. coming. Yep. She's coming on. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, there I am. Thank hey. you. Um, uh, you know, I had grappled with um, with Noir before I got to Miami, but Miami, as soon as I arrived, spoke Noir very clearly to me. And, and some of that does have to do with the deco buildings. Like they, it was, even though, as Les was saying, there's not 300 years to go back to, um, there's a sense of, in particular, uh, of Miami as this place that got built on opportunity and dreams. And I think that goes right back to the uh, you know, opportunity and dream, like I have, you know, the two things together, because um, the dream is an ideal, but the opportunity means grabbing and taking action. Um, those those are in noir. I happen to have worked on an anthology of James M. Cain's nonfiction. Um, right, right as I got here, I was I was doing that. I was a co-editor with Roy Hoops, his his the. Uh, <clears throat> biographer and he who had these various pieces. And so I spent a bunch of time going back because I'd read the novels going back and forth. And James M. Cain, they were using the term hard boiled then and the term noir came in from the movies. Yeah. But James yeah. M. Cain would refer back to tales of desperation from the 19th century of various sorts yeah. that had that had, you know, uh Les Miserables and things like that. That had this kind of also this desperation right. opportunity uh, and, and, and opportunity happening sometimes because society is somewhat chaotic. It's not, it can't, it's not, you know, holding everyone in place. But so I think my, I was primed. I did not think when I wrote this particular story, which has a dead guy in a car in Florida and, and it's, it's noir, um, or hard boiled, but I wrote other things that I was more consciously thinking of that. I wrote something that's in the, the original Miami Noir and I was definitely thinking about that and wanted that time reach as well. So, and then I, uh, one, of the, um, one of the pieces in the book uh, is, is from a uh, work that got published in Gulfstream Magazine, which I had uh, been responsible for starting at our writing program. And one of the things I was looking for was fresh voices that were talking about uh, that one happens to deal a lot with the gambling world that was here, racetrack world, things like that, which Preston's also written about the gambling world. So, you know, there's there's just a sense that it's a very good fit here. And the book shows that it always has been, uh, and it still is, you know, um, a place where people are uh, at those kinds of edges. Yeah, I think that's interesting what you say about uh, the the lack of a fully formed society because that allows for a certain kind of latitude where people are feel uh, more confident in making up their own uh, moral codes. And when you're in some place where it's black and, and white, the decisions are a lot clearer. And that's, to be quite honest with you, that's probably, you know, Hollywood at the time that noir became particularly yeah. popular yeah, was in right. Southern California, which was basically the same kind of terra incognita that, that Florida was in the, the 30s. Uh, Southern California was a nascent uh, community. Uh, the uh, developing, a, fr a frontier kind of place compared to even San Francisco, which was much more uh, uh, codified, a, you know, a descended from Eastern uh, mores and Southern California was kind of where all the outlaws went. So uh, I I think there, that's a really interesting uh, comparison that I I hadn't really thought much about until you were talking there, Lynn. Trish, uh, were you going to chime in? Yeah, I really like Preston's definition. You know, dark characters who don't like the laws as they are, so they create their own solution. That mm. I mean, that that just fits for me. <laughs> 
that kind of fits behind me yeah yeah I, and, yeah and particularly in the uh well right up to this day right i mean also you know we we just we just have a had a recent i don't know scandals the right world worry but we have you know creatures from you know, preacher's son from the mountains, but he's down at, at Miami Beach getting himself in trouble. And in a sense, these kind of these, these spaces that are where people can meet each other who wouldn't normally meet. I agree that the, the Los Angeles, the postman always rings twice. You know that that kind of just outside the edges, it, right. you could easily see and that the same kinds of you know juxtapositions of people here in in South Florida and. And and really the whole state, really the whole state, <laughs> as far as I can see. But definitely that that sense. Also, I think um, I mean obviously the depression was where some of these things started. But but the sense of gloom and bust and desperation runs. This particular book really makes very clear yeah. that there's there's that sense going on. Which in, in Trisha's story is like it's a it's a wonderful story that um, I hadn't read it before that. Uh, <laughs> It is very moving while sh because it's showing how people can still have grace and dignity yes. in circumstances. So. Can we get Vicki on oh, since there are only the six of us now? I'm trying. Uh -huh. So, meanwhile, <laughs> <laughs> you got some questions? <laughs> and Jeanette Delgado is out here watching and she has a question. Let's hear it. Did humor and heartbreak? play a large role in how you chose stories for this classic version of the book, sometimes more than the mystery at the story's center, at the story's center? Well, I think that uh, noir exudes a certain tone uh, and attitude more than maybe uh, it is concerned with whether or not there's a classic mystery plot or whether or not there's crime in the in the uh, uh, codified sense of it you know the uh, darkness is, is more the operative term although you expect that there's some sort of crime or divergence from normal behavior featured in the in in the plot and uh, you know I think too, that that humor, particularly dark humor, uh, the uh, humor based on irony, humor based uh, in uh, the concept of laughing uh, because if you don't, you'd have to cry, is really also a feature of of noir, and uh, so yes, I, I guess that. Those are those are things that I was looking for. Anyway, you know, there are lots of more than classic whodunits, and uh, you know, I, I don't think there's any darkness in Miss Marple. You know, in the whole <laughs> right, right, right. You know, in the whole ooh of Miss Marple. It's all it's it's all about puzzles. You know, and you know, it's it might as well be the crossword New York Times crossword puzzle. And, you know, I'm not you know speaking ill of that, but it's not noir. And uh, so it, it's, uh, it's, to me, I suppose, a little bit more literary than a classic uh, uh, crime Poirot kind of, uh, of story. Great. Would you say that... Um, no, Presley. Allen, would you say that Edgar Allan Poe is noirish for his time? Because as you saw... Oh, I absolutely would. Yeah. yeah. We just that vision is so dark. Yeah. So and, this is darkness. And, and I would say um, very specifically, something like the Cask of Amontillado, you know, because you're in a perpetrator point of view, which is another thing that you see uh, not always in noir, but sometimes you are with the people who are perpetrating, and that one has that quality, and it has weird humor. Um, but, you know, I, definitely I think that that's – I mean, I think a lot of American literature comes out of Poe, different right. different pieces of it. So, because he set up the rules for um, the way we write, I I don't know if anyone abides by it anymore. But 
the concept of a short story, the three unities of time, uh, person, and place, um, to, to give it energy and to give it uh, that sort of connectivity. Um, and we see that in most of his stories. And, and I think that our 1930s uh, version of Noor um, grew out of that, as well as if you look at um, the cowboy movies and cowboy novels. You know, it, you know, Clint Eastwood, the man with no name, shoot them up to get justice. If you change the lighting <laughs> and, and put a trench coat on him instead of a, a, a big hat, then you have noir, cowboy noir. Um, so, yeah. There is you know, a lot of Western noir, actually. Uh, and part of that is to the loss of the freedom of the space. You know, there's kind of, so there's a kind of extra noirness when that, that theoretical opportunity has been curtailed. So you, you'll see that in some of the other Akashic series books that are set. Right. Saying, right. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking sunshine noir right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. well, white desert. It's, it's the blinds. You know, that look of the blinds in noir required there also to be the sunshine in order to have that filtered, right. that filtered light. That's it's not cool. just actually gloom. So Raquel Reyes is asking, can you read the table of contents? Who else is in the collection? I'd be happy to read the table of contents because it's a who's who. Uh, yeah. First story, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, Pineland. Second story, Lester Dent Locke. Third uh, story, Zora Neale Hurston. Fourth, Damon Runyon. <clears throat> Brett Halliday, Doc, uh, or uh, um, a Taste for Cognac, the the uh, novella. Douglas Fairbairn, uh, a chance to find out who, in my opinion, is the progenitor of modern Miami noir and crime in Douglas Fairbairn. Charles Williford, Saturday Night Special. Uh, uh, Colette Bancroft of the Tampa Bay Times said this is most, one of the most amazing stories she's ever read. T.J. McGregor, James Carlos Blake, Elmore Leonard, Lynn Barrett, John Dufresne, Edna Buchanan, Les Standiford, David Beatty, Vicki Hendricks, Carolina Garcia Aguilera, Preston Allen, and Christine Kling. That's that's the lineup and quite a lineup, if you ask me. Wow. It's, it's so done. I just uh -huh. enabled here he is. Okay, so I just enabled the chat. If uh -huh. anyone wants to comment on the chat. Vicky has not been able to get back on and John was obviously <laughs> it was an hour ago. <laughs> if he was in the green room, so I'm not entirely sure. Actually, well, the, you know, a couple of other people. Carolina Worth is going to be with us. There. David Beatty. Oh. You know, John says he's still there. He just I, didn't get admitted. Well, I tried admitting him, but there's something. That's why we do these tech rehearsals. <laughs> it's, a, it's an odd, it's an odd uh, process. It's an odd process for sure. So for me, noir is virtual events. Virtual events are <laughs> for sure <laughs> so very mysterious um it's interesting i'll just let me see there's another question that has just come in okay but from barbara demarco um curious where you all start what inspired your stories vicky said old boyfriends what about the rest of you I had a character named Garen uh, who'd been, it was a kind of a guy who even at the 11th hour of his life was not ready to give up the possibility that he could still make a big score. And uh, when I came to Miami and saw all the preying on the oldsters uh, who lived in the condos uh, doing almost anything to pry the last dollars out of their their clutched fists. I said, 
I got another another Garen story here, and that's where my there I am. Up. There you are, Vicky. You're back. There I am. I just said that I couldn't find him. Yeah, I don't are. know what uh, you all have been taught, so I don't know what to say. Okay, <laughs> where you wanted to know where your story came from, where it started. Oh. Well, I, I can't go into that too far. Um, it it really did come <laughs> from a trip to the Everglades, and and it has a part in it with somebody feeding a lizard to alligators, which was really true. And then I had this um, uh, crazy boyfriend who. Um, Ex I exaggerated. Let's put it that way. I exaggerated him, but not too much. So <laughs> <laughs> that's really. I even. I even got the plot from him by just exaggerating <laughs> him a little bit. So that was that was an easy one. <laughs> um, my, my story. It was published in the Tampa Review first, but it wound up being the first story in my collection, The Secret Names of Women. And there's. I'm not sure how conscious I was of this, but there's a overall theme of impersonations of various sorts um, that are in those stories. And this one, um, I know that I got, I, got, I was in a, a Big Daddy's Flanagan's bar, something like that. And there were, you know, the question of your ID um, was there. And for some reason people were trying to, you know, they were trying to pretend to be older. And I just thought, well, you know, uh, uh, it would be so interesting if somebody gets an ID so they appear to be older, but like significantly, like 42, seem very old. <laughs> and th because then they are, you know, looking good. I just got that idea, which is sort of the idea for the business, like that the business guy has for, for that. And then it somehow fused with a story I had been told about, which is not in my story, but it had a, it had a family who had a, were in Florida and, um, one of the people in the family who was old died and they didn't want to have to go through all the uh, kit and caboodle to get the body back home. So they drove, <laughs> they drove home. And uh, which is, which exists as a, as a draft somewhere, a story that, that uses that particular plot. So, you know, all rights reserved, but um, I, somehow the two things, the, the false identity and then the, and cosmetics and, and whatever, and Florida car got joined together and, the, the, we have location lines, and Hialeah is really where a bunch of where the some of this story is, and then uh, 27 kind of going out from there, that edge of the old tourism, which was another thing I was really interested in. When Driving. I, when I, my um, my um, story, story actually came from actually Victor. came from <laughs> Her first novel, Her first novel yeah. Miami, Purity. Miami Purity. I'm echoing here, and I, I don't know what to do about it. It's not. Okay. Uh, yeah, stop. You're better. I just but, uh, um, I just turned off Lynn's microphone because I think she's okay. carrying over your sound. So All right. I think you're okay. Well, I the voice of that story brought to mind... Um, a young man that I knew in high school who was not the nicest person. Uh, actually, I knew him in junior high. He died when we were in high school. And he, he did a lot of shady things, um, except two good things. Um, he rescued his sister uh, from what we think was an abusive situation. And um, the end of his life, he was a woman, had her pocketbook stolen, her purse stolen at a grocery store. Uh, and he was a big guy. And he stood in front of the person who had stolen it. Um, he tried to apprehend him and he was shot and killed. And so reading your story, the voice almost sounded like his. Um, the way when he bullied us, 
<laughs> he was the same. And yet there was this other side to him where he was a big guy with muscles. And so one part of him was like, we couldn't stand him. But then he would do these amazingly beautiful things and one that actually uh, put him in the grave. Hmm. So, yeah, that's where I went. Thank you, Vicki, <laughs> for reminding me of this guy <laughs> when you read My Impurity. Really welcome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so. Trish? I think my story came from having gone into a Wolfie's when I was a lot younger with my parents. And I walk into this place and everybody in there is ancient, poor. And I thought, what the hell? I mean, what do you do if you're ancient, poor, and your body won't quit? Okay. So, well, what we do is what Millie did. She created, she was a, a nurse who retired, and she basically uh, had a deliverance thing. She would euthanize people who came in and came in last night of their lives. Last night. That was it. <laughs> well, we, well are, I, we are at the top of the hour now. Yeah. It's eight o'clock. I just want to say how lucky I feel to be surrounded by all of you and to hear these stories and listen to people who have a love of words and narrative. And, you know, that goes on um, even if we can't meet in person. I do so hope that the time is coming when we will meet again in person at Books and Books and share a glass of wine, break some bread, tell some stories, and be able to give ourselves a hug instead of doing this. Ah, from um, your lips to God's ears, yeah. Christina. But I thank you so much for being with us tonight. I remind everyone watching that you can order a copy of the book by pressing the green button at the bottom of the screen. If you're in Miami, you want to pass by any of our stores, um, they're open uh, for safe shopping. Uh, we also have curbside pickup. So I hope that we've already been selling the book very well, by the way. I've seen a lot of orders coming in um, throughout the last few weeks as we promoted this event. So I just want to thank all of you for being here, for doing what you do. Ah, Les has it. There he is. Hey, okay. <laughs> and um, stay safe and well, and keep doing what you do so beautifully. Thank, thank you, Christina. You. This thank is great. Thank you. And good night. And thank you all, my friends. Thanks. So thank much. you, Les. Thank you.